There was once an ancient tribe who feared the thunder's fury. Light pierced the night air, unchallenged by star or moon. This island was filled with storms and fog, but was still the home of a tribe that once existed. For now, no one has set foot here in over a hundred years, inhabited only by the grotesque ghostly remains of fallen people in stone altars scattered throughout the island. Upon entering this island, one must walk past a gate made from stone and would be able to continue their journey through its dense fog. It's no secret that when we explored the islands of Inazuma, a lot of us gazed upon the glimpse of the mysterious Trulmi Island, and unlike the five islands, this one is described to be uninhabited for a long time. No one is sure how this island first came to be, or whose original territory it was. This is what I'll be discussing in today's video, and to try sharing the information we gathered from artifact sets and the world quest. I apologize if this took too long, there was just a lot of info that was uncovered on this island. Spoiler warning to those who haven't yet, and I suggest you finish it first. Now I want to begin with the context of the murals we found on those ruins, which will give us a background to the history of Tsurumi Island. In an unknown time that predates even the Arkan War, an ancient moon-worshipping civilization settled in Tsurumi and constructed cities of their own. In this period, the climate of Tsurumi was very different and there was no fog that surrounded it. This civilization could freely see the wonders in the sky, moons, sun, and stars. Interestingly enough, they recorded some of their history in the murals inside Shirikoro Peak. They painted three mountain-like structures with leaves and a floating land above, which is most likely Celestia. What is noteworthy here is that this is exactly the same as the one in the Salvindigner murals. They have the same portrayal of Celestia and the same features of a person with a crown that seems to offer something to them. This is technically not possible, because both civilizations are geographically miles apart. What I personally think is that these lost civilizations are related to something important that we may discover soon in the future. Maybe the old link to the ancient Sili race and the three lunar sisters as noted by the same architectural style they used. However, let us still regard each of these sites as different groups of people with a unique history. Now for the first civilization that once lived in Surumi. It seemed that they became extinct, either naturally or forced by Celestia, possibly dropping a fragment similar to the Skyfrost Nail. From the looks of it, this civilization was quite familiar with the heavenly principles, yet was still destroyed all the same. This is when another civilization starts anew, from either the descendants of that ancient civilization or Inazuman washed ashore. They used the first civilization's ruins as their homes, but built their own shrines, domesticated when kamuis, and had a form of writing known as the Ashina script. This civilization is the one mentioned in the Thundering Fury set, and the one we see when we arrived at Tsurumi. However, before we go into that story, let us explore the meaning of those texts written on those murals. I gathered this from the official Genshin Impact Discord channel, and all those with a good background of Latin knowledge gave a full translation of the murals in Tsurumi Island. While it is not 100% accurate, its subject of speculation is due to the various interpretations possible to take, as well as due to the absence of words. Let us begin with the first set of murals under Shirikoro Peak. The letters written on the right wall can translate to wisdom is hidden in the pieces of stars, or wisdom is hidden within the shooting stars, or the star-studded piece of wisdom is hidden. For the one located in the middle wall, it means heaven is not watching, or heaven is no longer alive. For the one on the left, it means here surreptitiously lies flamboyant treasures. More interpretation can be a blazing silver light appeared from here, or the silver heat of which we shall not speak, or this silence is the deepest heat of silver. From these three, what personally caught me off guard was the translation in the middle. 
because its possible translation is heaven is not watching or heaven is no longer alive. As we can see in the mural, a floating island was once anchored above this area. There have been records that Celestia once used to communicate frequently with humankind. It is a mystery why the first civilization wrote this in their murals, maybe to warn future generations, or maybe to serve as a reminder of Celestia's separation from humankind, or something else entirely. However, these are all my theories, and there is no clear answer as of now. Now moving on to the second set of murals. This fourth one means, we pure boys and girls believe in the moon, and it was taken entirely from Catullus, a Republican Roman poet. This fifth one was also taken entirely from Catullus, that translates to, we pure boys and girls will now sing to Diana, or her secured strength, which could be a metaphor for the moon. This last one can translate to, lights of the moon are threefold and false. It can also mean, the moonlight will illuminate the moon goddess and the lies that surround you. Take note the word note can mean false or alien or foreign. There are a lot of possible meanings from these translations, but most of it doesn't quite make sense. What we do know is that Celestia dropped a strange object that caused the fog to emerge in Surumi Island, maybe as a way of concealing the remnants of the one civilization that lived there. For this chapter, let us explore the events that happened in the Thundering Fury set with some additional info from the World Quest. It is believed that its chronological order starts first with the circlet, then the goblet, the hourglass, the flower, and lastly, the feather. I want to credit this Reddit user for the summary post about this set, and it gave me a lot of possible explanations for the info I could not figure out. Now for its summary. Many years after the fall of the first civilization in Surumi Island, there existed a thunderbird that soared through the sky, bringing with her a never-ending storm that sweeps across the land. No one knows where this divine being came from, only that there was someone who gave it a name a long time ago. As this thunderbird was flying within the seas of Inazuma, she saw strange objects fall from the sky, and one of them landed on an island. This strange object suddenly began enveloping this island with fog. The Thunderbird saw this island, then descends for the first time in Mount Kana. Together with her existence, there was a tribe that started to worship the Thunderbird, either out of fear because of the terror that her rain and storms brought, or because the Thunderbird gave them the light to see in the fog, and also a way to communicate using her feathers. This tribe thought that it was the Thunderbird that brought the fog, and believed it was a protective barrier against the Sea of Darkness. Because the fog was hard to see for anyone who walked through it, they used the feathers dropped by the Thunderbird to play a melodious sound that can indicate their positions. They later imitated it through wooden instruments called the Maushiro. They also built a ceremonial site, and here they performed human sacrifices as an offering for the Thunderbird, hoping that blood would satisfy it to spare them from the storms. The tribe appointed elder shamans who would oversee the ceremony and wore a circlet that indicated their status. Before they start their ceremony, they had an hourglass of thunder that was used to predict the Thunderbird's arrival. During the ceremony, they used the goblet as the container of human sacrifice's blood and offer it whenever the Thunderbird would return to Mount Kana. It is possible that these sacrificial rituals can sometimes go extreme with cuts across the sternum or removing one's way of speaking. Little did they know that this Thunderbird was not a deity, but just an uncaring being who had no care towards humans and viewed them as animals. Despite the tribe's ceremonies and their human sacrifices, the Thunderbird had little care for them and paid no attention. Still, the tribe interpreted her unpredictable behavior as an act of divine guidance. It is unknown how many years they performed this ceremony, but the tribe's many years of sacrificial offerings had little effect of getting a response from the Thunderbird's divination. As generations of worship pass, Grandpa Mata becomes the current chieftain or priest and has a son named Ru. Ru grows up to be benevolent and sociable, upholding the remaining islanders. He also learns to sing remarkably and enjoys the dull island life. Despite his wonderful voice, he wasn't too confident with his singing 
and so he would sometimes sing in empty places, such as in Otake Plains. Then one day, as the Thunderbird was returning to its nest in Mount Kana, she suddenly heard Ru singing near a cliff in Otake Plains. The Thunderbird asked Ru if he was afraid of the storm, but Ru replied that he wasn't worried, because others told him his voice could bring peace to the thunder and storms. The Thunderbird told Ru that his song was special and none can compare to it. As the Thunderbird says, I have heard the songs of the trees, the strains of cloud and rain, and melodies sung by the green flying dragon of the far north. I have heard every trembling chorus of fox and rabbit as I descended upon the land. But your song is special. It is different, and I only know that I have never heard it before. Hearing this, Ru wanted to sing her another song if possible, and asked it its name so that he can call her whenever the time comes. However, the Thunderbird didn't have a name, but claims that someone gave her one long ago and is unable to remember it. So Ru decided that he gave her one and named her Kanakapatsir, the great eagle of the storm. This established a friendship between the two, and thus promised each other that Ru would sing to her again in the near future. Eventually, Grandpa Mata learned of Ru's connection with the Thunderbird, thinking that he was the most favored and blessed of his people. Grandpa Mata decided to sacrifice his own son Ru, believing that the Thunderbird might finally care and bless them with its grace. In the past, the Thunderbird paid no attention to the people who were sacrificed and offered to her, but now with Ru as their offering, they thought this would finally give them its blessing. Despite this, Ru voluntarily accepts, thinking it would be for the good of the tribe. The first descendant of Kama claims that this idea is pure madness alongside other antics, especially as Ru as his dear friend. He first tries to convince Ru to join him in leaving the island, but Ru refused, and so Kama alone leaves Trumi Island and settles in Serai. During the ceremony, as Ru's blood fills the goblet, the Thunderbird saw this, but she did not understand any of it and was filled with rage. Upon realizing that she would never hear a song again, she sang a song of her own, slaughtering the tribe and wiping it off the face of Tevat. Since you have allowed this one and only song to flow its blood into this earth, then until I, Kanaka Patsir, hear Ru's song once more, May these lands fall under an eternal catastrophe. She then fled the scene, leaving Tsurumi Island in cinders. Despite the tribe's offerings of blood, it was Ru's singing that gave the Thunderbird a sense of peace and a positive outlook on humans. This meant that it was always song that calmed the Thunderbird and not blood. By killing Ru, who sang to the Thunderbird, the tribe sealed their own fate without knowing. They never understood this, but we can't blame them, because ever since, they lived their lives in fear and were unable to communicate with this being who brought thunder and lightning. Years later, A hunted and slew the Thunderbird, claiming that it was an obstacle to progress. It is theorized that when the Thunderbird's dead body landed on Serai Island, her body formed the island's topography that we see today. When we invert the map in-game, we can see that it resembles the shape of a bird laid down. It was also the Thunderbird's beak that pierced the hole in the ruins we find beneath Amakumo Peak. While the Thunderbird was slain, some of its power still remained. Take note that gods in Tevat cannot be fully killed, because even if a god's physical form is destroyed, its will and power live on. After the Thunderbird was killed, the Asasi Shrine was built as a way to suppress the leftover power of the Thunderbird. And there were some people who relocated to Koseki village and made offerings at the shrine. Now jumping years to the time after the cataclysm happened, a certain person known as Asasi Hibiki arrived in Serai Island. During this time, there was a huge revolt against the Electro Archon and was led by Akadumiki Zaimon and Janomi Gonbei. From the Hamayumi, this Asasi Hibiki had magic learned from the Tengu and used it to release the resentment of the Thunderbird free. This was to save Domeki's rebellion, and also gain an advantage against the Electro Archon's armies. However, this resentment formed into the Thunder Manifestation, and it destroyed both the ships of the Shogunate army 
and Akadumeki's fleet. As a side note, some of Akadumeki's ships survived, and they were the ones who got shipwrecked on the Golden Apple Archipelago. Back to the topic. This thunder manifestation also caused the destruction of some parts of Serai Island, and so its inhabitants migrated to other islands in Inazuma. This includes the ancestors of Kama, and Odataru, and Fujiwara Toshiko, both of whom we met during the relics of Serai World Quest. Before we head to the third chapter, I first want to add some trivia, wherein the people of Tsurumi Island and the name of the Thunderbird Kapatir were heavily inspired by the Ainu people who live in northern Japan and some Russian territories. They believed in animism, thus the animals they hunted each inhabited a kamui. They would perform ceremonies to send back to the spirits of the hunted, as well as regards for the kamui they worshipped, hoping for better yield, much like Grandpa Mata's ceremonies in honor of the Thunderbird protecting them. However, unlike the Tsurumi people, the Ainu people don't sacrifice children to kamui. As for the term kapatir, it is an Ainu word for stellar sea eagle, but can also refer to a kamui. She's also called an owl in Narukami's affection, which would possibly connect her to Sikap Kamui, the owl god, who was regarded to watch over the country and its people. Again, unlike its inspiration, the Thunderbird in-game has no love for the people below her. For this chapter, it will explain all the mysteries regarding the fog and some dialogues we read from the ghosts of the tribe in Surumi Island. When we first ventured into the island, we can see the same tribe's people, but are unable to interact with them. It is only Ru that can see and talk to us. We then learn that the people on the island are just illusions trapped to reenact the events of the time when Ru was going to be sacrificed. They would replay these events over and over and the fog of Tsurumi would always return even after we cleared them ourselves. Sumida theorized that this was caused by a leyline disorder triggered by the Thunderbird storms, but we later discover that it was instead caused by a curse that the Thunderbird left after it destroyed the tribe. This was to serve as their punishment for sacrificing Ru. As for Ru's case, after that ceremony, Ru somehow wakes up sometime after being sacrificed and he saw those apparition records of the ceremony and disaster multiple times, and thinks the entire loop happened because the ceremony wasn't done perfectly. So his consciousness, if not his entire being, survived due to some kind of protection by the Thunderbird's power and the fog. The loop stops after we accompany Ru to Serai Island and fulfills his promise of singing to the Thunderbird. Now, as for those ghosts that we see after the world quest, I will summarize their situations and also the translations of their names. Let's start with Kito and Kana, whose names consecutively mean Siberian onion and edible plant or grass. We have already met the two during the interquests to Tsurumi. Before the sacrificial ceremony, they are little kids with a spirit of adventure. They sometimes join Sayo in exploring the ruins, most likely under Shirikoro and later found the murals there, depicting pre-cataclysm society. They also frequently picked up flowers for Una, whose memory has started to fail by that time. After the sacrifice and the Thunderbird's rage, they seemed to be unaware of their unfortunate fate, but they eventually decided to join the boatman, with Kito leaving behind a sachet to the traveler. Next is Una, whose name means ashes. Una was widowed at the time of the sacrifice, as one of the elderly people in Tsurumi, she was a staunch believer of the idea that the Sea of Fog was created by the Thunderbird to protect Tsurumi Island and exploring beyond it is dangerous, citing the loss of the Kama family's boy to justify this. Eventually, we found out that Una lost her husband when he attempted to cross the sea to explore the lands beyond it. He was swept back to Tsurumi as a corpse, with a handful of sakura blooms in his hand. As she turned older, she began to lose both her sight and memories, but she would occasionally talk about flowers that exist beyond the Sea of Fog. She eventually joined the boatmen after receiving the sachets of Kito and Kana, which was a sign that they have finally decided to give up on playing games. Now there's one thing she mentioned, and it was about the Sumari clan and a mysterious individual with fox-like ears, and is said to be the matriarch of this clan. 
This might be a hint for a possible character in the future, or maybe a future weekly boss that we will soon discover. Now, as for the other elderly man, Abe, whose name means fire, was curious about the world beyond the Sea of Fog, and was greatly worried about the fate of the Kama family's boy. Despite the clash of beliefs, Abe still brought fluorescent fungi to aid in Una's condition. Abe is himself a mushroom farmer, whose crops are found deep within the Shirikoro ruins, and has been wanting to look at mushrooms outside of the Sea of Fog. He even made a bet with Una about this. Ipe, whose name means blade, was joined by Makiri in performing the necessary tasks in preparation for the sacrifice. Ipe was also known to be close to Ru, and he was willing to teach Ipe about the Ashini script in exchange for learning how to fish from him. After the sacrifice, Ipe decided to not meet Makiri unless he finds someone who could look for the charm she gave to him. As Ru accepted his fate as a sacrifice, he thought about Makiri and Ipe getting married one day. Chise, whose name means house, is a youthful man who was also part of those preparing for the sacrifice. He had vocally condemned Sayo's attempt to sail off beyond the Sea of Fog for inspiring the Kama family's boy to do the same. During the day of the sacrifice, he had to find Ru within three areas. Chise traveled to Otake Plains and was implied to have met his end while lost in the fog. As a spirit, he would continue to ask for the Thunderbird's forgiveness as he remained unable to escape the fog enveloping Otake Plains. Nono, whose name means flower, is a person who is most likely a kid, plays hide-and-seek within the area of Chirai Shrine. Shitoki, whose name means ornamental necklace with a metal handle, is a man who has left with a treasure map torn into pieces and hid inside conches found in various places in Tsurumi Island. After the sacrifice, Shitoki remained stubborn about finding the treasure left behind by his brother, who sailed beyond the Sea of Fog and incurred the wrath of the priest of the island. The priest's identity is not known, but can be someone who existed before Grandpa Mata's time. The treasure would later be found within the Mount Kana Cavern. Rero is a man with a series of unfortunate events in his life, apparently. Among those events was the untimely death of his wife, which he called his chikapu, meaning bird. As the couple loved pulling jokes on anyone in life, Rero decided to pull off one more prank by his wife's grave as the woman's final wish. Sayo, whose name means porridge, is a woman with quite a reputation among the elders due to her curiosity about the world beyond the Sea of Fog. Ruin exploring and picking up shells were her interests, but she did not have Ru's knowledge of the Ashina script to understand the Ruin writings. One day, she decided to sail off beyond the Sea of Fog, convinced by an adventurous story of rolling green lands, a blue sky, and a golden sun, and was unable to persuade Ru to join her. According to Kama's story, there were no records of the Kama family's boy meeting Sayo. Now Sayo and Shitoki had some unique dialogues, since their stories opened to complete unknowns. We never knew who Shitoki's brother is, and it was not stated if he was the Kama family's boy or not, while we also never found out what happened to Sayo. Now I believe it is time for another set of trivia before we end this video. Do you remember the wooden maushiro we dug up from the ancestor of Kama? This wooden maushiro seems to be a mokuri, which is a traditional Japanese plucked ejiphone indigenous to the Aino people, similar to a joharp. The sound is made by pulling the string and vibrating the reed as it is placed in the user's mouth. The sound is like this. Gotta give credit to Paimon. She really guessed the boom sound correctly. Well, I hope you enjoyed my video about the secrets of Tsurumi Island. Admittingly, I was blown away with all the lore that can be found in this area. It was a bit sad though that there were no voice lines for this quest, or even a cutscene that shows the past form of the Thunderbird. We can only imagine having a similar voice with the Oceanid, or maybe a deeper voice of Cloud Retainer. There was a lot of potential in this quest, but overall, it was still a great experience. Now, if you have some thoughts about the video, as well as suggestions for future ideas, leave a comment and let us know. Thank you very much for watching, and if you think it deserves one, give this video a like. Once again, my name is Clementine, and as usual, until the next one, 
Be safe and stay tuned.